Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing, Episode 232, K. Kenyon, A Thousand Perfect Things. Today's episode is sponsored by The Planet Killer, Starhounds Number 4, by David Bischoff and Saul Garnell. It's basically about the business of writing, and they tell you the stuff they wish that someone had told them when they got started as writers. You know, somebody can be a successful marketer and not necessarily provide a quality product. I'm going to let Moses go because he's frothing at the mouth to talk about this one. <laughs> <laughs> I like writing. I like reading. I like to immerse myself in books. So that seems like a pretty good career choice. Tomo arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> oh, you sound terrible. What happened? I'm just kidding. Oh, man. <laughs> And now, constructed on a Zeppelin by an apprentice mage and delivered by a rocket ship to a benevolent dragon, Adventures in Sci-Fi Public Sci-Fi Everybody, Timothy C. Ward here. Thanks for coming over to Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing. I'm very excited about this interview today. John Dodds, our book reviewer and also an author who lives in Bulgaria, read and loved A Thousand Perfect Things, and I thought it would be cool to have him on the line when we interviewed Kay. And he did a fantastic job, so cheers to John. Thank you so much, Kay. This was a wonderful interview. Her book, A Thousand Perfect Things, is beautiful and very touching. She gave me the chance to read a passage from it, and it really moved me. Both reading it for the first time and reading it aloud, I'm just so excited for you guys to um, to hear this. Her book explores um, a young woman who has a handicap, and so she's kind of out of the love game, and she also is very passionate about science, but because she's a woman, uh, science doesn't want her, and uh, she travels from an alternate England into a uh, an alternate India, uh, from science to magic almost, and uh, it's just a wonderful story. It illustrates the conflict within all of us between passion and ambition and uh, our personal view of success. It's just very very appropriate for me and uh, for all of us aspiring authors and really anyone that wants to do something with their life. Um, so I think you'll enjoy it. I'm posting this a day early because uh, Kay has a deal going for A Thousand Perfect Things. It's now only $2.99. Uh, it's available on Kindle, Nook, and at the iBooks store. Uh, but the deal only goes through Monday, so I wanted to get this out early so you'd give uh, to give you more of a chance to take advantage of that deal. We have an episode on Wednesday with Emma Newman. Uh, Brent Bowen interviewed her at the Hugos. She has a book coming out, the final book in the Split Worlds trilogy, on Tuesday. And so we wanted to get that out. We'll have that out on Wednesday for you. On the website, I highlighted some book covers from the Gemmel Awards. If you go to our website, you can see those, or go to gemmelaward.com. That's two M's and two L's. There is a Ravenheart Award for book covers uh, in the fantasy genre, and an award, the Morningstar Award, for first book in English. For the Morningstar Award, they have Saladin Ahmed's Throne of the Crescent Moon, Miles Cameron's The Red Knight, John Gwynn's Malice, Aiden Hart's Irenicon and Jay Kristoff's Storm Dancer. For the Ravenheart, the book covers Brent Weeks's The Blinding Knife, Joe Abercrombie's Red Country, Stephen Dias, Dace, uh, The Black Mausoleum, Jay Kristoff's Storm Dancer, Rowena Corey Daniels' Besieged, and Michael J. Ward's The Legion of Shadow. We also have a book review for Star Wars Empire and Rebellion Razor's Edge by Martha Wells. Thank you to our reviewer, Greg Pelicky for that. It sounds like uh, it's going back to the main characters for that book, so it looks like a good one. Okay, without further ado, enjoy the show.
All right. Well, I am pleased to welcome to the show Kay Kenyon. Hello, everyone. Very glad to be here. We are very glad that you're here. <laughs> and we have one of our bloggers, our uh, reviewers, John Dodds. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. John is calling us all the way from Bulgaria, so this is pretty cool. John read Kay's most recent novel, A Thousand Perfect Things, and I'll let you, John, summarize your feelings for this book. Well, first of all, I, I thought the book was absolutely fabulous. I've been a lover of sci-fi for probably a, a, all of my reading life, but this 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 feels very different. Uh, it's uh, Obviously, it's... It's fantasy with sci-fi elements, I would say, but it's also really connected with the kind of literature I, I sort of grew up reading as well. You know, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, um, all of those things. So that kind of feeling came across quite strongly. I don't know whether it was intentional or on your part, Kate, or not, but because of that richness, the, I suppose the literary feel as well, it really appealed to me tremendously. Well, uh, Victoriana uh, has just taken um, the world by storm, it seems. Everyone is writing in it, including the steampunk genre. Um, and I'm no exception. I, I love 19th century uh, English and, and world views. I, I find them fascinating. So I, I wanted to play there for a while. Well, I, I, I think you've actually done it much, much better than um, some of the steampunk in inverted commas uh, novels I, I think a lot of those tend to be somewhat more adventure based relying more on on fast pace and action than the the kind of richness richness and depth that you have in yours particularly in your characters and your sense of place and uh, the the politics and the sexual politics and all of that that goes on in your book there's so many multiple layers in it that made it a really re rich read for me and I, I certainly urge all the listeners to the show to read it read it it's it's wonderful well thank you so much so okay i'm curious you wrote 10 science fiction books before before this one what mm. was what was your thinking about entering into this genre and and this story did that start while you were writing some of those other books uh it did um Part of it was a kind of a sense of exhaustion after I got into the four-book series, The Empire and the Rose. Uh, the books were long. The series was long. It probably got me the most attention for anything I had ever written, but I really found it uh, quite exhausting. I was ready for a change, but already with that quartet, I was kind of leaning into fantasy a little bit. The whole world of The Empire and the Rose felt a little fantastical and unexplained and uh, I guess I I was looking for something to charge up my my enthusiasm for writing I wanted something a little different and um, the the move to fantasy seemed like something that would just be marvelously exciting it would be something different for me and I think at a certain point in your writing, it's time to try to re-energize yourself. So that was my main thought. And then it was not far from my thinking either that fantasy sells better. So you'd look at that too. And um, I thought I'd give it a try. I, I think I'll stay here for a while. I like it so much. Is this the first in a series or is it standalone? No, it's standalone. Um, but I may be doing other alternative histories. So that kind of subgenre may be one I stay in for uh, a few books. I guess my first question was really about how you came to develop your version of India, which in the book you called Bharata, um, and it feels very rich and you can feel the heat and see the colours and all, all that sort of thing. And I wondered whether you did your research through reading purely or have you visited India or how did you go about approaching that? Well, uh, no, I have never been to India. I so wish I could go there, and um, but I, I took it all from primary research and secondary research. I, I read books on the British Raj in India, um, lots of fiction about India, and took lots of notes. So it was really purely from from research, um, and I. 
I found that, that I chose the the um, the place and the uh, the, the uh, exoticism of India precisely for the reason that it's so sensual and it's so rich in what it can bring forth in uh, imagery. And so I chose an easy era, I think, to bring alive. Well, I, I think you succeeded incredibly well and uh, there was something about it as well that uh, changed with me. I, I, I had to do some research into India for my second novel, Kali's Kiss, and um, I feel that you, you captured the milieu really well. And there was something about the situation that mm, not exactly reminded me of, but had slight, slight echoes of the, the central character in um, Ian Foster's passage to India, who gets who gets into a bit of trouble when she when she goes to in, mm-hmm. to India, and uh, so, but yes. it, you know, it, it felt like I, w- I was in, it felt like I was there. I think so. You did that fantastically well. Well, I I thank you for that. I you know I I tend to write novels around big world building concepts, so I'm I'm very into the sense of place. So I, I may overdo that a little bit, or I, I, I value that and bring that in. But I, I think more than that, uh, uh, the experience of being in India came through uh, a little easier for me, and I think for the reader, because you see it through the eyes of Tori Harding, my main character. Because I, I think otherwise, uh, you know, you and place is just so much scenery. Uh, unless you you are experiencing it somehow vicariously through the character, and I chose the character very carefully to be the one that would be most amazed by what she was seeing, and she would be most unfamiliar with the sensuality and the politics and the freedoms and the constrictions. She she would be from this totally other culture. So. It's kind of the old mm, strategy of the stranger in a strange land. But I, I really am always a believer that the character will bring the stage to life. Uh, yes, absolutely, and uh, I certainly wasn't suggest. Didn't mean to suggest that um, you know it's like watching a. a, a a documentary uh, about a place. Uh, it very much came through your your character's eye, um, eyes, and uh, you know Tori's sense of um, the strangeness of it, uh, and in some sense this familiarity because there was something that she connected with when she was there too. Um, since you mentioned Tori um, in your alternate nineteenth century, she's a, she's a fantastic character. Now there was something about the idea that she's living in a time when the very idea of a female scientist is at odds with the times that she's living in. I wondered, I suppose, if she was inspired by anyone in particular, either in literature or in life, and kind of what what does she represent for you? I mean, obviously there was, uh, she felt like she had some kind of significance for you in, in other respect, other than a character in a book, if you like, in, in terms of what she was trying to do and and how she was at odds with her own times? Well, I think that she did represent something for me in the um, the kind of the classic dilemma of women in the world, even today, is um, shall, shall I be domestic? Shall I have uh, a passion that takes me somewhat away from um, domesticity, children, and those kinds of um, experiences. The whole idea of can you have it all as a woman, um, I framed up Tori Harding such that she she was stuck. She had a longing to, to have a romantic side to her life, but because she, uh, she, she has a handicap that... It makes it unlikely she will ever marry, and that forces her into science. And yet science also (laughs) rejects her, and so she is kind of cruelly denied all her aspirations, and and it makes makes her choices all the more more fraught and all the more meaningful. And uh, I wanted to force her to the edge to see what she valued and and what she wanted. And uh, in the end, it... um, even though it is a love story, uh, she didn't choose love. 
Yes. So I, to me, I, I had to kind of work that through of um, if you have a great passion and you, you are asked to choose, which one is it? Maybe that tells something awful about me that I'm so obsessed with my career that <laughs> I don't know. Well, N- um, not at all. It's interesting that that uh, you said she didn't she didn't choose love. In a way, I feel that she did choose love because the the love of what you do, uh, the, the her love of uh, science and of her grandfather, and all of that. And in terms of being a, a, a creative person yourself, there's a there is a kind of love involved in that. And if you don't love sure. it, you don't do it. You know. That's true, but I would think of that as you know, as a as a passion uh, for life, but not it's not romantic. It's no. romantic love. I, Although you know, there is a I, distinction, I, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is, and um, right up until the very end of this book, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Normally, I I'm so sure, but I changed the ending several times <laughs> until yeah. I came to the one you read. I really had no idea how you were going to end it at all. So uh, I, I was surprised, as, as as any reader might be. So you succeeded in 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 uh, <laughs> pulling off something which which I thought was actually uh, perfect, but also a real surprise. Kind of strange to hear that we're we're talking so much about character and so little about plot and magic. But um, I I thought I'm glad to have this discussion this way because I. Um, I was hoping that in fantasy I would have the chance to write the deeper story. I heard Greg Bear say one time that, that science fiction is about the outer life and that fantasy is about the inner. And all my career in science fiction, I kept writing adventure stories uh, based on the inner story. <laughs> you yes. know, adventure stories based on character. And I'm not entirely sure that worked out so, so very well but I'm glad that now that I've moved to fantasy that choice seemed to work for you. I, absolutely and and uh, you know let's not forget the the fantastic uh, adventure story that's the spine of the, the the whole book and the way that you've really used um, fantasy elements and science you know so arguably the, the you know the the bridge across the the sea is is a science fictional rather than a than a fantasy element because it, you know it makes me think of a an amazing engineering feat. Um, so uh, there is that, and you know the very dangers of crossing that bridge and the, the things that happen there without giving you know releasing any spoilers. Um, that was quite an adventurous segment uh, in the book, and and her whole story is very much an adventurous story. So I think from that point of view, it was thoroughly enjoyable if you just like pure adventure stories it's definitely that too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well i i enjoyed doing both uh, i don't i don't see how uh, you can do um mainstream fiction without doing both i mean it seems like it's got to move along <laughs> it's got to yes. be a story problem and uh, you have to care about the people but i find yeah. myself reading a lot of books even in fantasy where um, I don't see both things going on. I wanted to make yeah. sure mine had that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I think it, I think it works both ways. I, I you know, I, I've read uh, like your book and other other writers, uh, people like Connie Willis, who I, w- I would regard as as uh, writers of literature, and um, mm-hmm. I've also read literary works which are incredibly dull because I, I think you said in a previous um, interview on the show uh, uh, something about you know having something happen uh, is, is important even in a even in a work of literature which after all people argue is a is a publishing term anyway mm-hmm. I, I wanted to just before I move aside for Tim I just wanted to ask you one more question again it's about character is something that I, I'm very passionate about in my review which i you may not have read yet. I don't know uh, if, Kim, if Tim has shared it with you yet, but it will, it will be on the yes. site. Um, yes, uh, I did read it. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I felt that your character, Mahindra, who I, I loved as a character, had uh, shades of, uh, you know, thinking of the wire-rimmed glasses and so on, and, and his his political motivations as much as his, his spiritual impulses um, had had something about Gandhi about him. Uh, is, am I way off beam in suggesting that? 
No, uh, absolutely. I I was astonished that no one except you so far has picked that up. Um, <laughs> but yes, definitely a Gandhi figure. I felt some trepidation uh, to twist my character uh, to make him quite different than Gandhi in some ways. So, you know, in some, I'm fiddling with, uh, you know, some some sense that it's a, a historical character of such such respect that you don't almost dare, but there you go, I did it. <laughs> but I, in the end, you know, he is a hero uh, and flawed, deeply flawed, as as Tori is. Her her whole colonial acceptance and 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 her um, kind of almost thoughtless ambition. Uh, so neither of them come off perfectly, but uh, he uh, to me was the kind of the independence movement of India, Mahindra. Uh, uh, that, well, I'm glad I'm glad I picked that up, but it wasn't I wasn't too far off being there. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks. As you've answered my 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 main question, I'm going to hand you back to to Tim. The Planet Killer, Starhounds Number Four, the classic series enters now space. When last we left our heroes, they were trapped in a strange dimension with strange aliens and stranger relationships. Laura Shemzak, still hot and ready to party. But with her handsome brother, Kalspar, uh, time to cool those rockets. And the Federation? Up to their dystopian mischief. If only that darn Tars Northern, his ship the Starbow and their crew, could be captured. But there's a Joker in this new deck. The Joker is dead serious. A brain that used to be a man named Dr. Harla Zox, packing a new sinister power in his starship, fresh from destroying the planet that had once harbored him. Cult favorite David Bischoff returns to the Starways, aided and abetted by hot new science fiction talent Saul Garnell, to bring you old-fashioned space opera thrills enough to rattle any modern tractor beam. You can learn more about The Planet Killer, Starhounds No. 4, at hotspurpublishing.com. We've talked about some characters. Maybe for the audience that's not as familiar with this book... Okay, if you could kind of paint a picture of the setting, maybe explaining, because we mentioned the bridge. If you could maybe mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about how the bridge connects to very different societies and how, because uh, that's, if I'm remembering right, a relatively new thing to the story, this bridge being completed. Uh, I'm wondering how those two sides are now going into conflict. Yes, um, I not only twisted history in going back to um, the British Raj in India, I also twisted uh, or extrapolated uh, the geography of the world. And so I was positing that there are two great continents of the world, one um, science-obsessed England and the other spiritual and magical India. And by the way, the name Bharata is the ancestral name of India. Uh, and Anglica is the obvious uh, twist on England. And uh, the um, I'm trying to set up uh, as a metaphor in the world the, uh, the intellectual dilemmas that people had between science and, and magic. So I created the alternate Victorian England where I'm saying science uh, has taken such a deep root that Anglics feel nothing but fear and outrage over intrusions of magic into their lives, which come in as magical terrorism. And the source of all that ma- magic is the what they call the mystical continent of Barada. There is magic, but it's very closely entwined with religion. And we encounter in this land things, ghosts and inanimate beings brought to life and monster phantasms and shapeshifters. It's almost as though magic is part of the very ecology of Bharata. And the bridge between is uh, kind of a portal device where you have to travel a long way with great dangers to move from the land of of empiricism and um almost arrogant um, machine-based logic 
to a land where sensuality and and religion and mysticism hold sway. And the, the bridge is created by Anglix on uh, this master feat of engineering. Um, and when you cross over it, you've left the land of logic and you're somewhere else. Set us up a little bit as far as the characters from the Anglican side. What is their goal as they're crossing over? As with the British Raj in India, they have a want a military presence there to safeguard their trading interests in diamonds and cotton and all those trade goods that England so desperately wanted and got at such good um, rates <laughs> in, in exploiting India. And as this story opens, there has been magical terrorism um, intruding into England, uh, including a, a, a massive terrorist event on the River Thames that overwhelms the palace and uh, kills a lot of people. And they go over the bridge to show the flag to say, um, we have our military presence already there it will now be bolstered up. And to, to cement their cultural dominance of Bharata by sending teachers out into the field, which which was one of the um, the actual complaints against, uh, among many others, against colonial England in India was that their their very culture was being taken away by this Anglo Anglicization of schools and the teaching of English and um, moving away from traditional values. So that's part both the military presence and the the, the cultural erasure of traditional values was all part of the, the colonial plan, and it always has been. You know, you, you you first take the stuff, and then you take the minds. One of my favorite driving forces of the novel is uh, the character Tori. It's not much of a spoiler. It's in the earlier part of the book. Uh, there is a plant that um, her grandfather has a map on, and the magical powers of this plant and her pursuit of that just really opened up the world and made it like a modern day fantasy. How are you using that aspect to maybe drive your interest in the story? Well, uh, you know, just structurally there has to be a goal. So I wanted to give her something actual to, to take, but the golden Lotus that she is trying to um, find a specimen of it really changes everything when she starts to look for it because everything really about the book is about that flower when you really think about it. So her personal ambition is is overwhelmed ultimately in the novel by, by the need to control this power. And everyone's after it. You know, there are all kinds of secret forces at work, everyone looking for this at the same time. And... It, it, it turns out to be something so incredibly different than anyone had known. I, I just I wanted to throw everybody um, against the wall on this one and, and have it be something that could not have been predicted either by magic or science. But you're right. I mean, I, we should have had a big golden lotus on the cover of this book. <laughs> it, it really It's really more than a MacGuffin. It, it, it was an emblem of of ambition, of spirituality, and of a, kind of the great unknown. Would you mind if I read a couple of sentences from your book? No. Actually, what I was reading today, it's in Chapter 12. Let's see. Colonel Harding, is that her dad? Yes. So her dad is talking to, uh, to her, to Tori. He says, instead, he'd said, write us, my dear, and tell us how you fare. If he did not mistake her, her eyes were bright with tears. Oh, I shall, Papa. I hope you won't worry. Please do not. Nothing of that sort. Merce Smith and Connolly will watch over you, and I'll have their stripes. Her smile came readily. Then for their sakes, I shall have to behave. We cannot expect so much, my dear. Just find your peace. She had looked at him curiously. Peace? Shall I be pleased with myself for so little reason? He said, I am pleased with you for every reason. It was true. She needed to be nothing more in his mind. But it was in hers that mattered. Uh, that's an, an awesome passage, Kay. I, 
Oh. I'm a little choked up just even reading it. You were saying before about telling the inner story. Uh, I wonder what this story meant to you in relation to this theme about her father being so proud of her that nothing else she had to do would matter to him as far as making him love her more. But yet for her, there wasn't peace because she says, shall I be pleased with myself for little reason? Uh, this this desire that we all have that uh, our loved ones love us so completely and yet we are so unsatisfied with where we are. I'm wondering how this story and, and Tori's yearning for that helped you not only as a person, as a writer, and, and why you love this story. Well, it's really strange that you picked that um, that particular passage because, in a way, the whole title of the book and everything I was trying to do in the book was about that futile quest for perfection and how how false it is in, in some ways. And but Tori's quest for this discovery is is her quest for her life to be perfect. Not only because she would then be somebody, but also to oddly fulfill her grandfather's overweening ambition to not only be the preeminent biologist of his day, but to be deathless in some way, the last, even though he's 87 years old, the last huge discovery that he leads her into. And um, I wanted the book to set up several people in it for whom love was enough. And, And as the story progresses, it is obviously not enough for her, but your question about how does it reflect myself, um, that's a stunning question. I, I, I Immediately, I admit that you get to a certain place in your career and in your life where, where you ask, why am I doing this? You know, what does it say about me, my legacy, and whether those things even matter? Um, I, I think when you are in the arts, you're always asking yourself, uh, is it all about ego? <laughs> um, if it was all for just love of storytelling, then we'd never we'd never be unhappy. We'd never. I don't know if ambition drives us to do greater things, or if it drives us nuts because we're never where we <laughs> we we wish we would be. You know, I'm not Connie Willis, um, so will I ever be happy? So I, I think this impossible quest for the perfect thing is something I do think about um, a lot, and probably. I didn't know that until you <laughs> asked me the question. <laughs> so did this book help you in that pursuit? Does this does this book kind of give you peace in ways that you didn't have before? Well, that would be too simple, I think, for um the question's just too big. I I I think uh ever since I was like eighteen years old and studied Buddhism, you know, I, I thought that there might be some way to peace that could somehow bypass this need to um, achieve. And I, I still don't know the answer to that, but I, I'm happy that it lurks inside me somewhere as a good question, mm-hmm. <laughs> because every time you bring up the question, you feel just a little bit more at peace. Mm-hmm. Can I pitch in something here? Just wanted to add into what, what Tim was saying. Uh, my own feeling is that that the, the act of creation isn't necessarily about finding peace. It's a it's a kind of profound impulse in everyone in one way or another. I mean, we're products of creation of some sort, and we're all living our own myths and mythologies. And uh, you know, even the kind of Jungian modelling of of how we are, who we are as people involves things like archetypes and character and adventure and all that sort of thing. So, I, 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 what I'm hearing from you, uh, Kay, is something about maybe expressing something about that inner adventure and that constant seeking. And would that would that feel right? Well, I, I'm very. I think that's what I, I, I've. I feel. Like, 
the impulse to create, as you put it, is uh, a great gift, and uh, it should not be something we strive to get rid of. But where where it crosses over in into um, turmoil is when we attach results to it. So I've written this book. Some people find it profound and wonderful to read, um, but will it? sell? Will it win awards? Will everyone understand? Will I have good reviews? You know, there's, um, there has to be a balance between that impulse to create, that passion and detachment from Absolutely. the result. And, and that is where I utterly fail. I admit it. <laughs> uh, but, but thank goodness I can ask that question and I know that, it's, I know that it lurks because yeah. that's healthy. But I, I think that if I had that balance and that action, I would probably make a lot more money being a guru. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we really appreciate you making time for our interview today, Kay. I'm going to, in the show notes, read off some of the tour dates or book signings, because I, I know you have a few in October uh, around Portland and Washington. Was there anything else that you wanted mm -hmm. to mention um, for our audience? Um. I'm thinking of going uh, to World Science Fiction in London next year, so I'd love to see people and um, connect that way. I'll probably be at NorwestCon in the spring in Seattle as well. One of the things that is uh, hardest for writers is the fact that they, they have to buckle down and be alone at the keyboard, and I, I don't see enough of people, and so uh, even a phone call like this is, uh, is very, very much fun and gives me good balance in my life and so I hope to see readers out there at some of these upcoming contacts and we just have to hope that there will be no magical attacks on London during your stay there <laughs> that's right I'll, I'll be checking I'll be checking out that that statue in Trafalgar pretty carefully uh, absolutely those, those lions I'd, honestly <laughs> <laughs> okay I did mean well, I did mean to ask you was there a place in your book that you would prefer to live between the Anglican side and the other side? Oh, yes, India. <laughs> By far. Um, it's, it's the land where, where she comes in into touch with her, her deepest feelings and, and her, own, her own creativity. So that would be my place. Very good. Uh, John, did you have anything else to mention before we go? Uh, not at all, just to say it was a privilege for me to talk with you, Kay, and I very much look forward to reading your next book. And again, I want to urge listeners to the show and everyone else uh, to pick up a copy and, and read it. It's a fantastic book. Oh, that, that, John, that's very kind of you. I really appreciate it. And, and Tim, thank you for this opportunity. Um, nice interview, and um, nice to talk to both of you. Yeah, yeah, great to talk to you, Kay. We're we're pleased to be able to uh, be a part of your life and uh, to read your fiction. Thank you so much. Thanks again to our sponsor, Hotspur Publishing. The novel is The Planet Killer. You can find that at hotspurpublishing.com or facebook.com slash starhounds. Visit Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing for show notes, links, reviews, special guests, videos, and more. Email us at adventuresinsci-fi-publishing at gmail.com. Sound effects from the Free Sounds Project. Music by Asymmetry, found at musically.com. No authors were seriously damaged in the making of this podcast. <laughs>